Good morning, it is Wednesday, June 1st, 2022, and I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray that the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we're going through the book of Ephesians, and we're in Ephesians 4.4, 4, but to uh, begin with, let's read the first six verses of chapter 4. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech ye that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. I believe Paul is here articulating the entity, entities or the components for the unity or the oneness of the body of Christ. And he starts out with by saying, there is one body. One body. This is the church the body of Christ, where all ethnic and religious distinctions have been done away with. The makeup, nature, and characteristic of this one body are found only in Paul's epistles. And it is my opinion that this one body is also identified as the new man. The new man is Christ and the body of Christ united together in one. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 16. That he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby. The Jew and the Gentile, since Genesis chapter 12, have been separated and are two distinct groups of humanity. They make up the entire human race. You're either a Jew or a Gentile ethnically. The Jews come through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three of those in order. It's through Jacob's family that the tribes of Israel were formed. His 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel, and they are called the children of Israel. Going on with this one body, it says here in uh, Romans 12.4 For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Paul's talking about our physical body and all the different organs and functions and systems, all of those things. And he goes on to say, they make one body. And then he goes on to say, so we, now referring to the church, the body of Christ, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Every person who has trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior has been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body of Christ, and we become one, so intricately united together that we are members of one another. 
And then 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as, in the, for as the body is one and hath many members, again, talking about the human body, and all members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Paul is emphasizing the fact that in this one body, we've all been united together as one. Colossians 3.15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And then again, a very important characteristic or nature of this body is that all the ethnic distinctions have been removed. Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That is the one body, the new man, the church of today. And so there is one body and one spirit. I believe this is referring to the Spirit of God, the third person in the Godhead. It is the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ that is now indwelling every member of the body of Christ. And so Romans 8, 9 says this, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so how do you know that you, are, that you have the Spirit of Christ? How do you know that you are saved? Well, first of all, have you believed the gospel of salvation that Paul preached? His gospel is that Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. If you have trusted Jesus Christ, believing that he bore your sins in his body, that he died and shed his blood to pay the complete price for all of your sin, you are saved. And the instant you believe that, the Spirit of God dwells in you, takes up his residence in your life. And that Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. If you are saved by grace through faith, you have the witness of the Spirit of God confirming your salvation in Christ. Another verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 11. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will, talking about the gifts of the spirit that the spirit bestows to the members of the body of Christ. And then Ephesians 2, 18. For through him referring to the Christ and our faith in him, for through him we both, Jew and Gentile alike, have access by one spirit unto the Father. And so there is one body and there is one spirit. And then Paul goes on to say, even as ye are called in the one hope of your calling, one hope of your calling. Jesus Christ is our hope. That's found in 1 Timothy 1.1. 1, 1. And this one hope, I believe, is referring also here in this verse, the one hope of your calling, I believe is referring concerning the future for the members of the body of Christ. The initiation into the realization 
of this hope, this one calling, will begin with the resurrection of the dead in Christ and the catching up of the living earthly members of the body of Christ. Let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now listen carefully to what is being said here. Those who have trusted Christ since the gospel of the grace of God has been revealed, those who believe that Jesus Christ had died for their sins and have since passed away, have been immediately ushered into the presence of Christ. Their body was buried or cremated or whatever might have happened to that body. Maybe it was obliterated or uh, completely uh, dissipated through an explosion or through an intense fire, whatever it might be. That is almost irrelevant. The important issue is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, which Paul says is far better. And so for all of those who have died trusting Christ as their Savior, have been with him in heaven since their death. But I believe, according to Paul's teaching, that they have been unclothed. Their spirit and their soul have been with Christ, cognitively aware, in heaven. And so that's what Paul is writing about here. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive, now that's referring to those who are still living here on the earth, and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them or have an advantage over them or precede them which are asleep. Now the word sleep doesn't mean not being conscious. Here it's more of a euphemism for having died. And they are present with the Lord. They're cognizant. I just don't believe in what is called soul sleep. Where when you die, you go to sleep. And the next thing you realize is the resurrection. If that were the case, I don't see how Paul would say to be uh, dead or to be absent from the body is far better. Paul desired not to be unclothed without his body, but to be clothed with his heavenly body. And so I believe in the interim, at the present time, all those who have died in Christ are with him in soul and spirit. And so he goes on here to say, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Now, that's not his second coming. This is his secret coming, as we'll read here. Shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, not on the earth. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Again, jumping to 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Paul writes, Behold, I show you a mystery or a secret. What he's talking about is not found any place else in Scripture. We shall not all sleep or we shall not all die, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. 
and we shall be changed. Now that word raised, and in the previous passage, it talked about the dead shall rise first. When we hear those words, so often we think of going up. But when the Lord Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he didn't ascend into heaven. He didn't go up. What he did do was he was aroused from sleep, or he stood up erect. And that's basically what the word raised and rise is referring to. Not to come out of the grave and go up. Paul's telling us a secret about this resurrection. And so let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore shall nothing, therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Now, Paul's talking about this secret coming when he comes for his church, the body of Christ, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will manifest the counsels of the heart. And then every man shall have the praise of God. For the believer in Jesus Christ, all judgment, all condemnation, all sin has been eradicated and done away with. The Lord Jesus Christ suffered and endured the punishment for our sins. So when we are caught off this earth to meet the Lord in the air, in that time frame will be what's called the Bema Seat of Christ, which is also sometimes identified as the Judgment Seat of Christ. But it's important to understand that that judgment has nothing to do with sin. It has to do with our works as believers. Those works will be evaluated to see if they have value or no value, to see if they are good or no good, to see if they are like gold and diamonds and precious stones, or if they are wood, hay, and stubble and will be burned up. And so the final passage is 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, this is part of our blessed hope, our call, hope of our calling. If this earthly tabernacle or this body is dissolved, we have a building of God. This house, this tent, was temporary. God is going to give us a permanent structure, a building of God, and listen to its characteristic or description. It is a house not made with hands. It is which is eternal in the heavens. The new house that I'm going to have is eternal in the heavens. It's not designed just for this earth. Going on in verse 2. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Now it is my opinion and it is my faith considering the fact that this is all a mystery, that our concept of resurrection has been clouded or confused with the hope of Israel. The hope of Israel is that one day their bodies will come out of the graves, those bones will put on flesh, and they will enter into their earthly kingdom in a terrestrial body. For, for the saints, the members of the body of Christ, and the hope of their calling is to be clothed upon with our house, our building, which is from heaven. And so it is my opinion that the body that we used while we lived here on earth, that old tent, has been done away with. And whether it's been buried, cremated, uh, dissipated into ions, eaten by animals, burned in fire, whatever it is, is of no significance. 
because our new body, our celestial or our heavenly body, comes from heaven. That is such a wonderful hope, eager anticipation, because it's going to be fashioned after his glorious body. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, what a blessed hope we have in the church, the body of Christ. Thank you for this marvelous gospel of your grace and for the unsearchable riches of Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.